We're going to take a look at a resonant gate drive circuit for MOSFET. Now, MOSFETs um, are turned on and off by applying a positive voltage or a negative voltage to the gate relative to the source terminal. When the, uh, when the gate has a charge that is more positive than the source terminal, above the threshold voltage of the MOSFET, the MOSFET turns on. When the charge is below the threshold voltage, relative to the source terminal, the MOSFET is switched off. And I've set up a circuit here in this little simulator to take a look at resonant gate drive idea that I've been working on. On the output side of the MOSFET we have a small uh, circuit consisting of an LED, a current limiting resistor, and a 12 volt power supply. When the MOSFET is switched on, current will flow from the power supply through the current limiting resistor, through the LED, through the MOSFET, from drain to source, back to the negative terminal of the supply. Let's take a look at the MOSFET. Now in real life, a uh, MOSFET has a lot of different characteristics that are not necessarily modeled in this simple circuit simulator. So I've added additional components around the MOSFET to kind of um, simulate some of these other effects that are naturally present in a real MOSFET. First thing you'll notice is this large uh, Zener diode between the uh, the drain and the source terminal of the MOSFET. This is really the body diode of the MOSFET. All MOSFETs have what's called a body diode that is uh, reverse biased. And the reason I used a Zener here is because that body diode will actually break down at a high enough voltage and you'll, the diode will conduct in what's called avalanche mode. And uh, I'm modeling a 200 volt MOSFET here. And so I've set the Zener voltage to 250 volts. So if for some reason the, uh, the drain voltage um, gets to be 250 volts higher than the source, um, then this Zener will break down and conduct. And that would be very similar to the MOSFET going into avalanche mode. It's not something we probably want to happen, but it's there nonetheless. And of course, if current uh, flows from source to drain, it'll, it'll go through this body diode if the MOSFET is not turned on. The next thing you'll notice are these two back-to-back -back Zeners on the gate terminal. These are actually included in some MOSFETs, and the purpose is to limit the, the maximum gate voltage, either positive or negative, um, to prevent it from becoming too high and destroying the gate insulation and ruining the MOSFET. Not all MOSFETs have these, but some do to make them more robust. Um, they're here in my circuit just to simplify things and make sure that the gate voltage doesn't go too low or too high. But um, in real life, if your MOSFET doesn't have them, you could either probably add your own Zeners, or um, you can design your drive circuit so that it never creates gate voltages that are too low or too high. Now this capacitor is very important. This represents the gate capacitance. All MOSFETs have a capacitance between the gate and the, and the source. That's because the gate is insulated, and when you have two insulated terminals, you have a capacitor. And the, this gate capacitance is really the big problem that we're trying to deal with here because it takes a lot of current to charge and discharge that capacitor every single time we want to turn the MOSFET on or off. So that means we have to push a lot of current into the gate, pull a lot of current back out, and we have to do this repeatedly. Now if we're trying to use the MOSFET at a high frequency, uh, moving a lot of current in and out of the gate can create a lot of heat and places a lot of stress on the MOSFET drive circuit. So the, the main goal of this simulation is to see if we can get that current from somewhere else and uh, really simplify this process so that our drive circuit doesn't have to supply this constant push and pull of high current. Now in real life a MOSFET is not going to have 10 microfarads of capacitance on the gate. That's a huge amount of capacitance. But we're going to use this simulator at a low frequency so we can see what's going on. We want to clearly see the effect of the gate capacitance. So I've just used a large value here so we can see that effect more clearly. This resistor represents the gate resistance. All MOSFETs have a certain amount of gate resistance. It's like a built-in resistor in series with the gate, and it has to do with the physical construction of the, uh, of the MOSFET. The gate, the silicon, and the materials that are used, there's a certain amount of resistance that's there, and it, it kind of limits um, you know, how fast the gate will charge or discharge at any particular current level. Let's take a look at our drive circuit. 
On our drive circuit, we've got another 12 volt power supply and an on and off switch. And we've got two um, other switches here. Now, in real life, a MOSFET drive circuit would probably be using a, a low and a high side uh, switch, which is actually built out of MOSFETs. And in this simulator, I didn't want to deal with all of the complexities, so I just used simple analog switches. These things open and close uh, depending on if there's a high or low signal to the control terminal here and here. So it's very, very simple, and um, that way we don't have to worry too much. In, in real life, this, this, these two switches would be part of a MOSFET drive IC, and they would be MOSFET switches. But one thing we don't want to do is to have to have these switches supply large amounts of current to the gate here. That's where we run into trouble. At high frequency, these have to supply a lot of current constantly back and forth, and they get really hot, and they just, they're really not up to the task. And using bigger MOSFETs here um, to supply more current just pushes the problem further back. Now the question is, it's going to take a lot of current to turn these guys on and off. So it's not really a good, a good approach. Now what I've constructed is it, right in the middle of the circuit is the important stuff. We've got two little squares. I don't know if you can tell, but they're uh, little circuits of their own. See? Complete circuit. There's a capacitor, an inductor, and a resistor in this one. And over here there's a capacitor, an inductor, and a resistor. Now when you have a capacitor and an inductor together like this, you've got what's called an LC tank circuit. It's a resonant circuit. And um, current flows in and out of the inductor and uh, charges and discharges the capacitor. And they work together really a lot like a pendulum swinging back and forth. Um, you could think of the position of the pendulum as the stored voltage perhaps across the capacitor. You could think of the uh, movement of the pendulum as perhaps the stored current in the inductor. And these two things are going to trade places constantly. At the bottom of, of its swing, the pendulum is moving fast, but there's really no potential. When the pendulum is up on the, t on the left or right side of the highest point of its swing, there's a lot of stored potential in terms of gravity, but there's really no movement at that moment. So all the energy is in the inductor. So what happens in a, in a tank circuit is energy is transferred back and forth between the capacitor and the inductor, just exactly like a pendulum swinging. And it's going to do that, just like a pendulum, at a specific frequency. And that has to do with the value of the capacitor and the inductor. It's going to determine the frequency. Now one thing that's a little special here is this resistor. This is probably not something you'd use in your real circuit, but I've used it just to simplify the drive. Um, Using this capacitor, we can measure the voltage through this loop. I'm sorry, the current. The amount of current flowing through this loop at any given moment will be uh, represented across this resistor as a voltage, according to Ohm's law. So one ohm of resistor means if there's one amp of current flowing through it, there's going to be one volt of voltage across it. And if current is flowing the other direction, it's going to be negative one volt of voltage across it. So we can basically use this resistor here to monitor the current through this loop. All right? And what we're doing is we're monitoring that current here, and this comparator is comparing that, that voltage that's visible across the resistor, comparing that voltage with ground. And uh, so when the, uh, when the voltage is, is higher than zero volts, this comparator is going to have a low output, and when the voltage is below zero volts, the comparator is going to have a high output. And that's going to open and close these switches. It's going to do it exactly at the right moment, exactly in sync with the natural oscillation of this tank circuit, the swinging of the pendulum, if you will. We're going to, we're going to give it a little push and pull, exactly uh, synchronized with the natural swinging or oscillation of this circuit. So this uh, basically is a little, little tiny uh, resonant tank circuit. And what we're doing is we're feeding in, because this is a small capacitor, we're feeding in a small amount of that signal into the next circuit. This is another LC tank circuit. There's, we're going to use the same inductor and another capacitor. And of course, this capacitor is the built-in gate capacitance of the MOSFET. So it's not even a separate component. The only thing that's external to the MOSFET here is this inductor. 
it's uh, connected in parallel between the gate and the source of the MOSFET. So we're going to take advantage of the built-in gate capacitance and we're going to let current flow in and out of the gate into this uh, inductor, back into the gate, out of the gate into the inductor, back into the gate, and this gate capacitance is going to charge and discharge. So really what we have here is another oscillator. It's another resonant tank circuit that's going to oscillate it at a natural frequency. Because these two <clears throat> share an inductor, they're actually going to resonate at the same frequency. So let's take a look at this circuit in operation. Here we are. No current through our LED. You can see it's off. And the current through the LED is represented on this uh, graph down here. And uh, this is uh, showing the logic signal to the uh, switches. One of them is normally open, one is normally closed. So you'll see a square wave here as these switches open and close. And this is really the, uh, the charge in the MOSFET gate. The green line is the gate voltage, and uh, we're, just, we're just reading that directly off the gate capacitance. There's really not much going on here. No current through the LED, MOSFET is off. Um, and there's a little bit of voltage on the gate. It's oscillating up and down. It's just picking up noise and it's oscillating at its natural frequency. But at uh, 366 microvolts, it's nowhere near enough to do anything. Let's turn this thing on and see what happens. Now, as these switches open and close, high and low side switches, we're, um, we're pushing current through this capacitor and uh, creating a little bit of an oscillation in this first circuit. I want you to ignore what's going on here and just focus on the first square. Look at the little yellow dots showing current movement. You can see they're going back and forth, back and forth. It's like a pendulum, but it's, a, it's, not, a very, uh, it's not swinging very high. It's just going back and forth, gently, little by little. This represents this, this uh, slow current flow means that there's very little current moving here, which is great. Our MOSFET drive switches are, are not having to do a lot of work just gently pushing this first uh, pendulum back and forth. But because this is tied to the next uh, LC tank circuit, that back and forth current is contributing to a natural oscillation that, that builds up in this next circuit. And her, here's the gate capacitance and the external inductor. And as you can see, we have a much larger oscillation. Uh, the current's moving much faster, and this represents a much higher voltage. Now, we look at the gate capacitance, you can see what's going on here. We've got the gate is being charged all the way up to 16 volts, then being discharged uh, down to negative 16 volts, which is completely fine. In fact, probably ideal. And uh, a lot of current is moving in and out of the gate, but where is the current coming from? It's coming only from this inductor. It's not coming from our drive switches. The inductor is storing the energy, pushing it into the gate, and then as the pendulum swings naturally back the other way, that current flows out of the gate back into the inductor where it's stored for the next cycle. So um, this is pretty cool. We can supply lots of current to the gate and not have to drive it with a lot of current using our drive switches. We just have to have a little tiny drive signal, just enough to kind of get this thing swinging. So let's reset it and watch the gate signal build up over time. Take a look at this graph down here. Oh, by the way, this uh, square wave, this yellow one, that's the current through the LED. You can see the LED is turning on and off as the MOSFET switches on and off during each cycle. And we've got a nice square wave here. And that's because even though the gate voltage to the MOSFET is a sine wave, and you'd think, oh, it's only really on uh, when it gets near the top, that's not true. The threshold voltage on the gate is very low, like maybe between 1 and 3 volts. So any time that this 16-volt uh, high sine wave is above 3 volts, that MOSFET is fully on. So as you can see, it's, it's on pretty solid most of the time, and it's also off very solid. And in fact, it's off just a little bit longer than it's on, which is very, very handy when you're trying to use MOSFETs in a high and low side drive situation like this. You never want them both on at the same time, because that will create a direct short from your positive supply all the way to ground. So let's reset this thing and watch the MOSFET gate voltage build up in this graph right here. Here it goes. You can see 3 volts, 
5 volts. So what's happening is, as this little oscillator pushes and pulls a small amount of current, that small amount of current contributes to what's happening in the big oscillator, and it's building up a higher and higher voltage. The only requirement for this circuit to work correctly is that you drive it at the correct frequency. You're going to have to select an inductor that matches the gate capacitance to, uh, to naturally resonate at the desired frequency. And then you're going to have to open and close these drive switches at precisely the resonant frequency to make this work in an efficient way.